All right. Well, we just got done talking about light. Now we're talking about what we do with that light. Now, one of the greatest inventions ever for, in terms of astronomy was the telescope. The telescope really was used in the early 1600s since then. Uh, we have changed it drastically, but it is the number one tool we can use because, again, the only way we know about our universe is by understanding the light that comes to us by observing it, by analyzing it. And just by looking around the universe in the telescope is the way that we do that. Now, first off, the telescopes that you're going to know are ground-based. They are small scopes. Uh, the red one in the upper right corner here is very much like the one we have in our classroom. I also have one I can bring in that's more like the one in the upper left here. There are two main types of small telescopes. They're called the refractor and the reflector. The refractor uses a lens as its main way of affecting the light, whereas a reflector uses a mirror. Now, these are both useful for different reasons, and the simplest one is the one with the lens, the refractor. That's what Galileo used. Galileo had two simple lenses, and he just changed their position relative to each other to focus in on different objects. And that was the first one made. Isaac Newton actually developed the reflector telescope, and it was actually something that really got him kick-started in the scientific community. So he developed a reflector telescope, looks a lot like this. So oftentimes you'll see a Newtonian reflector when they refer to that. But the big difference between the two is that the reflector, the one that uses a big curved mirror at the end, so you have a big curved mirror down here, um, this can be shorter to be just as powerful as a much longer refractor. So it's easier to carry around, easier to build. And actually, it's a lot easier to build big mirrors than it is big lenses because big mirrors can be a combination of a lot of little flat mirrors, whereas a big lens has to be a solid lens, and those are very difficult to make. So with the refractor, light comes in through the initial lens. It gets affected, and typically this is what we call a converging lens. Um, it's kind of like the lens you find in magnifying glass. And so that light is kind of brought together, and then it goes through the eyepiece lens. And uh, typically, the bigger the lens, the more light it lets in, the better the image you will see. A reflector telescope has light coming in, hitting a big curved mirror at the back. This is called a concave mirror. Um, the mirrors on the side of a vehicle are convex, they're the opposite of this. A concave mirror can magnify images. And so it reflects light to another little flat mirror, which sends up through an eyepiece. There are different variations of both of these, but the two main types of lens. Refractor uses a lens developed by Galileo. Reflector uses a big mirror developed by Isaac Newton. Uh, you can go into really any store, Target, Walmart, and buy a simple telescope. Uh, the bigger the telescope, the better what you're going to see. But, you know, if you just want to look at some galaxies, uh, the moons of Jupiter, or the moon, you can get a smaller power telescope, which is cheaper. Uh, but if you really want to see more, you got to get a much bigger telescope. Now, we also have ground-based large scopes, and these are ones that you cannot purchase. These are ones in observatories all over the U.S. and the world. Uh, larger scopes were made in place at higher elevations because it wants to reduce the atmosphere's effect on the light. The atmosphere, we already talked about this in the electromagnetic notes, it absorbs certain types of light. And it messes with the other light that does pass through. Stars do, well, let me change this. All stars do not twinkle. Now, there are stars that tend to fluctuate in brightness to get brighter and dimmer. But when you look at the night sky, you see the twinkling of stars. Well, no, that's actually caused by our atmosphere. If you look at the stars on space, you wouldn't see the twinkling. Now, there are some stars which seem to get brighter and dimmer. We can call some of these pulsars. They send pulses of light. Um, or they're called variable stars. There's a very important type of variable star called a Cepheid variable. Uh, we use Cepheid variables to actually figure out how far away distant stars are because their brightness is tied into how much they vary. Now, there's a size limit for how big the lens of mirror can get if it's a single piece. Mirrors can be, could be larger than lenses. Uh, so the early telescopes did use lenses, but then we started switching to mirrors, and we were able to build bigger and bigger and bigger telescopes. But they all had the same problem. They're here on Earth. They had the atmosphere blocking. So even our best images weren't that great. And uh, ground-based large scopes typically deal with uh, visible light, what we can see. Now, Kitt Peak Observatory is one of these large ground-based telescopes. 
as part of the National Optical uh, Astronomy Observatory. It supports the most diverse collection of astronomical observer observatories on Earth for nighttime optical and infrared astronomy and daytime study of the sun. Uh, studying the sun is different because you're dealing with a lot of light, so you actually have to cool down your telescopes using like liquid nitrogen, liquid oxygen. Um, there are some major telescopes here. You can actually go visit these and look at those and see what they see. Uh, but there are very large observatories. We really don't have any large observatories here in Iowa. And the reason is because we have a low elevation, which means we have a lot of atmosphere, which will interfere with the light. Now, a reasonable observatory is the world's largest single-dish radio telescope. Now, first off, this is not a mirror or a lens, but actually behaves like a mirror. This does not deal with visible light, but it deals with the other types of light. So what happens is that uh, other types of light will hit this surface here and then be bounced up into this little receiver. So think about if you have a satellite dish on your house, it's the same thing like this. Except for we're looking at different types of light are the visible. And the bigger the dish, the better the information will be. And so you can see that uh, we can actually get a tremendous amount of information from an observatory like this. It also takes up a lot of space. And there's a lot of up. This is the very large array, and um, this is one of various types of uh, telescopes like this. They're again not dealing with visible light; they're dealing with other types, radio waves, infrared. Um, and you can see that this setup here allows it to behave like one giant telescope at that size. And so these all work together. They all look at the same exact part of the sky, and they're all taking information that gets sent to central computers in which we can analyze it. But again, there's no eyepiece to look through, so we're actually having to use computers in order to study this. The very large array in the world's premier astronomical radio observatory, so it looks at radio waves, 27 radio antennas in Y-shaped configuration. Each antenna is 25 meters in diameter. The data from the antennas combine electronically to give resolution of an antenna 36 kilometers or 22 miles across with sensitivity of dish 130 meters. 422 feet in diameter. So by combining all these up, we get a very, very large telescope in a sense. Now, space-based telescopes, those are our best. In order to look at spectrums above visible, our telescopes have to be above the atmosphere. The telescope's first place in space is something more than we ever thought possible. Uh, we thought possible. There we go. Uh, the Hubble telescope was one of the premier ones. There have been other telescopes played in space. The Hubble telescope is by far most famous just because of some of the images it's taken. You can see here some early images taken of the Hubble, and this is a later image. And there's no way we get that detail really here on Earth. The Hubble here is up in the left. Um, when it was first put up, there was actually some problems with it, so we had to repair it. But the Hubble is near the end of its usefulness. Um, we're going to be retiring it soon. It was launched in 1990. It is one of the most successful long-lasting science missions. We have gotten tremendous amount of data from this. You go online, you search for Hubble images, you will find a ton of them. Uh, every 97 minutes, Hubble completes a spin around the Earth, so it moves about 5 miles per second, fast enough to travel across the U.S. in 10 minutes. As it travels, Hubble's mirror captures light and directs it into its several scientific instruments. Uh, the Chandra is another type of uh, space-based telescope, but it does not look for visible light. Instead, it looks for X-rays. So higher energy light. So there are different things in space that emit X-rays, and we use this to study them. The James Webb Telescope is going to be the next step up. It's going to be the next evolution of the telescopes because it's going to be more powerful. It's going to get better images. It's going to allow us to see farther into space than we ever saw before. It's going to see clearer, uh, and that's kind of the way we go. As we develop better tools, we'll understand our universe better better and better because we have, remember we're in this little corner off in our universe and we're just trying to study it the best we can and we have to look at the light. Uh, this is an example of what the James Webb will look like. Uh, 